uh, share uh, the same slide I actually showed you last time, uh, which is a common myth uh, that you know cancer is incurable. And, uh, it's very common. Even uh, educated our current life, it is not curable. That's not true. So we are going to talk how to uh, you know today uh, try to focus on how to prevent cancer, cancer screening, and some very brief outline on various treatments we have for cancer. So this is a slide I actually showed last time. So we are making progress, as you can see, about uh, 91 to 2015, 26% uh, reduction in cancer death rate. So there has been significant improvement, okay? Uh, so the so first part of the talk is about detection, diagnosis, and screening. So one of the issue with cancer uh, is that it is usually not symptomatic. Early stages are symptoms in Davila. You don't sit with it, you know, it will immediately cause symptoms. The reason is uh, most of what we call as symptoms are caused by body's reaction to uh, something like inflammation. Whereas cancer cells, because they are number body in a part usually there's not a lot of inflammation in the beginning uh, stages. Symptoms, pain, uh, swelling, uh, weight loss, other in the course late stages. So this is where screening is important in cancer. Okay, so that is which I just mentioned. Cancer early stage cancer uh, usually uh, symptoms are down in the lab. and that is the reason we have all kind of different screening uh, we use for cancer. So one of the earliest cancer screening that has been in uh, has been uh, well documented to help uh, uh, is cervical cancer. It's using a technique called papunicolor stain, and this is uh, significantly decreased the cancer death from cervical cancer. In fact, um, almost by more than seventy five percent. So nowadays, um, it's uh, it used to be a major uh, uh, killer for uh, women uh, cervical cancer. Nowadays. Most of these are detected at a very early stage. So pap smear is one screening where there is not a lot of controversy. Most guidelines strongly recommend pap smear is an approved and a very useful uh, cancer screening. Breast cancer screening is again a, a well documented to help. Uh, this is usually done after age um, 40 according to some guidelines according to 50 according to some guidelines but most guidelines say after 50 it is approved uh, and it's uh, paid by most insurance as a screening test again screening has its own downsides uh, we do not have to go through all those but um, uh, screening does have some downside in the sense unnecessary biopsies a lot of abnormalities that you find uh, on the screening uh, may not necessarily be cancer and it causes a lot of anguish psychological trauma and all. So screening is great, but it does have some downside. But uh, breast cancer screening, especially after age 50, is considered standard of care. If someone has a family history in Dangla, you didn't move in a channel. 50 and then move in a screening number of Prostate cancer is something a little bit more controversial, uh, especially family history in Dangla. Uh, prostate cancer screening uh, using PSA is also uh, something that is recommended by at least some of the guidelines. And again, if you read upon screening um, as a layperson uh, or even as a physician, this can be very confusing because different uh, different uh, people, uh, different guideline committees will have different guidelines. And that is because the cost benefit of screening is a little bit complicated because even though for an individual patient in an early stage of detective that it is clearly, you know, save him from dying from cancer. When you expand it to the society, there is also, also downside to screening. Reward unnecessary biopsies, unnecessary uh, procedures are covered in screening chamber. Karan Palapur screening chamber, we have a PSA elevated nearly 70% uh, of the elevated PSA actually are not from cancer. So, you know, that causes a lot of mental anguish and stress, uh, biopsies, you know. So it is not like, you know, uh, it's not a blanket uh, recommendation, you know, some screening, uh, even though for an individual, it could be life-saving. Uh, for as you spread it out to the society, it can be a little bit tricky. Uh, people are trying to develop, of course, the accurate screening. In the cell, false negative screening, develop 
ശ്രമത്തിലാണ് ആൾക്കാർ for ovarian cancer we do not have a good screening test as of now and that is uh, something that people are working right now uh, uh, as of now ovarian cancer do not have a good uh, screening test colon cancer is something there are multiple ways to screen one uh, uh, fecal occult blood nu parayittu stool occult blood test kiya it is not a very sensitive test but it is a very uh, you know cheap and uh, safe test Uh, the gold standard is colonoscopy and this is recommended for people above 50 uh, colonoscopy is an invasive procedure uh, it is uh, compared to other screening it does actually carry a significant risk of complications because it is a kind of a surgical procedure it has to be done by anesthesia there is a tough preparation to go through but a colonoscopy is better than that sir at the same time you are being screened you can also treat if a colon cancer almost always arises from or pre existing benign polyp nanu varunathu appo colonoscopy il namaku a benign polyp kandala adu maati kazhinal it is not only a screening but it is also a treatment so colonoscopy in that way has significantly reduced the number of advanced colon cancers so if uh, most of the cancers advanced uh, colon cancers nammal ippo actually kanunathu are in fact younger people who never has screening uh, but you know that is still not a, a, a to say that you know younger people should go through screening as of now i recommendation is people above 50 number of years old have should have a colonoscopy after discussing with their doctor now uh, if you have significant family history you know if you have a family member who had colon colon cancer at uh, age 40 you probably need colonoscopy starting at age 30 and that is uh, similar to mammogram you know if you have a family member with a, who had a breast cancer uh, 40 years undengil your breast cancer screening should start at age 30 not at age 50 so family history is very important when you consider screening so it's not again uh, not one size fit all okay uh, so this is where genetic testing comes into play again this is something you can't do um, without discussing with the physician um were uh, they randomly nammal gene test cheyumbo it has lot of uh, you know issues with that so but in an appropriate setting if you family members oru vaad aalkarku namukku early stage cancers undengile it is very important to do uh, uh, screening uh, genetic testing karam genetic test ipo positive aanengile so for example brca is a common uh, uh, mutation of that causes breast cancer so if someone has uh, brca our the screening recommendation is going to be very different uh, than someone uh, brca illatha ralde karanam brca increase your risk of for breast cancer oru vaadu high aayittu increase appo aa or mutational aalkarku will need more aggressive and more early uh, uh, screening so that is where genetic testing comes into play in terms of prevention i did mention you know a significant number of cancer are basically mutations that we cannot prevent but nearly one third or more than one third of cancers are preventable and in terms of certain cancers like lung cancers i would say more than 60 70% are preventable so uh, cancer prevention is something that we could do certain things you know we can you know i'll explain or expand on this a little bit more uh, so first and foremost then this is well known you know tobacco is the single most risk uh, for a preventable cancer if there is one intervention that you can do uh, to prevent cancer uh, it is to stop tobacco and the correlation is almost linear you know the more tobacco you talk you smoke the higher the risk of cancer it is well documented it's interesting that uh, for the longest time the tobacco industry tried their best to confuse the people you know trying to say tobacco doesn't cause cancer now ipo adu parayumbo namukku you know it feels like you know did that really happen and that really happened actually for decades tobacco industry especially in the southern part of us you know they tried to make this assumption that you know this anti tobacco is almost like a yankee uh, you know a conspiracy Uh, because most of the tobacco uh, farms were down in the south and believe it or not i may still see an old people or old patient right, right now who may have say lung cancer from tobacco who would still refuse to say uh, believe that actually tobacco causes cancer so 
and the reason i was this is unrelated to our talk but this is the same technique if fossil fuel industry is doing with global warming and almost exactly same playbook you know try to you know confuse the the lay public so nowadays but however you know almost everybody has you know know this for a fact another interesting thing about tobacco is that if you have a family history of a tobacco induced cancer so suppose you have a family member who had lung cancer or esophageal cancer head and neck cancer these are the various cancers that can be caused by tobacco not just lung uh, you know it increases cancer of bladder kidney significant number of uh, tumors are uh, increased by tobacco so if you have a family member who have a tobacco induced cancer your risk from tobacco causing cancer is way more than general population so that's a easy test to see you know what is your risk you know the average risk we say is 10 to 15 times higher but if you have a family member for example if you have a family member who had certain say for example small cell lung cancer if you have a mother or father who smoke and had small cell lung cancer your risk for uh, lung cancer from tobacco is close to 100 times it's not 15 times so that's a important fact to remember now we are going to talk a little bit more detail about this because you know in, um, unlike tobacco which thankfully a lot of people are not doing these days all of us have to eat so you know what what does the you know diet and exercise play in, in prevention so we are going to talk we have a couple of slides in fact you know taken straight out of american cancer society so this is you know kind of in a nutshell you know be lean as lean as possible you know without being underweight uh you should not weight uh, weight gain uh, should be avoided at all ages and if you are obese uh you know even small amount of weight loss uh, should be helpful and regular physical activity and you know limiting high calorie food intake you know is very helpful and this is the nutshell but since this is an important aspect and this is something that affects everybody we will have some more slides on this so in terms of calories and uh, or or meat consumption this is just a kind of um, many of the studies are because diet studies are very hard to do many of these are correlation so because human diets is a diet is very difficult to study but you can see the colon cancer for example and meat consumption in various countries you know almost a linear correlation so this is the number of uh, cases of colon cancer and this is the amount of meat consumption especially red meat you can see almost a linear correlation so it, so so this is uh, you know kind of concerning you know so when you have too much red meat now body weight again you know this is another important factor these are the common cancers that are importantly i mean usually associated with breast cancer i mean body weight and these are almost called metabolic syndrome cancers you know we all heard of metabolic syndrome that is diabetes heart disease cholesterol but some of these cancers could fall under the same category of metabolic syndrome these are breast colon and rectum endometrial cancer especially uh, you know we almost most of the endometrial cancer we see nowadays are obese women cancer of the esophagus kidney pancreas so uh, these are the things that are very closely related it is also related with some other cancers like gallbladder liver certain lymphomas myeloma even cervical cancer ovary and certain forms of prostate cancer that are a little bit aggressive so these are the cancers that can be associated with uh body weight or people are obese so uh fruits and vegetables especially colored food you know so food that are naturally colored appears to have protective effect now the one thing to remember is you know there are so many this a multi billion industry you know take what is uh, helpful in this food say curcumin or resveratrol and turn that into a tablet that really is not a good way to you know two things because when you remove a, a healthy component from food and turn that into a tablet you know most of the time it probably loses its biological efficacy because the body we are evolved to use food uh, you know not to use tablets so supplements yeah of course if you have some uh, you know if you have a really bad diet you know you probably want to do that but supplements is not a, a replacement for a healthy diet 
All right. So again, about diet, you know, so make sure you read food food labels. You know, it's very important to actually read what you are buying. You know, one thing I tell my patients, and this is applicable to all people, you know, you know whether you have you know cancer risk or not. I mean, is when you go to most of the the grocery store, try to stay away from the mid portions. You know, stay outside the grocery. You know, so that is where you have your fresh fruits and vegetables and even you know meat. But when you get into this Packed, you know, most of the so 90% at least in the US is all this packed food. Most of them, you know, are probably not very healthy, you know. So, uh, so just read the labels, um, you know, plenty of whole fruits and uh, nuts. Uh, if there is one diet that seems to be, you know, somewhat healthier than other diet in most of this, not only cancer, but also heart disease, is so called Mediterranean diet, which is, you know, rich in. Um, you know, so, you know, um, da, uh, nuts, and you know, it's, it's actually fairly tasty, also. So, uh, think of when you want to look at uh, a diet plan, you know, think of Mediterranean, Mediterranean diet. Uh, sugar is something that you know is best to be avoid, avoided, not only for cancer, for other reasons, also. Processed meat, again, things that are like you know, processed, you know, it adds an extra layer of because a lot of uh, additional products, you know, ke you know, chemicals has to be added to make uh, food processed. Uh, fruits and vegetables, you know, we, we talk about it. It's kind of hard. You can probably try to juice it, uh, but it's important to have most, uh, you know, fruits and vegetables. Whole grains, you know, is uh, again important. Uh, so there has been studies. This is not, um, you know, just my opinion. Because like I said, diet is very hard to study, okay? Diet and cancer and diet and any disease, even though they get the most publicity, you know, any diet study, you know, it's all over the news. Because like I said, everybody has to eat and everyone, everyone wants to know what is healthy, what's not. But it's extremely hard to do randomized controlled trials on diet. But we do have some suggestion that, you know, this food, uh, you know, like a healthy diet is beneficial, especially in the so-called metabolic cancers like breast, ovary, and endometrial, colon, prostate. Alcohol, again, uh, you know, you should limit the number of, uh, you know, drinks. Uh, so alcohol is associated, excess alcohol is associated with cancer of the mouth, throat, uh, esophagus, liver, colon, rectum, and breast also. So limit, um, uh, so that way the recommended dose is, you know, like you should not, uh, two drinks per day for men and one drink per day for women. And drink, by definition, medical definition is 12 ounces of beer, five ounces of uh, wine, or one and a half ounces of the hard liquor. So that is called one drink. So you should, if you're a man, you should not drink more than two. If you're a, uh, if, if you're a woman, not more than one. Now, this combination of alcohol and tobacco is actually uh, synergistic. So your risk goes, you know, significantly high. So if you have only one risk factor, when you but when you combine them together it goes almost like 40 times right so smoking and alcohol and this is called you know this is a risk of esophageal cancer uh, so that is um, you know um, uh, Christopher Hitchens many of you know it was a wonderful brilliant guy uh, I'm sure many of you have heard of Christopher Hitchens uh, unfortunately he died at a very young age and because he was uh, you know, he was smoking and he was drinking all the time so, um, so that's very important to remember that combination is uh, uh, almost multiply your risk. Physical activity, again, we didn't discuss that. Uh, so there is clear data that shows physical activity decreases certain cancers. Again, the so-called metabolic cancers, so there's a breast, colon, endometrium, prostate. As you can, at least breast, endometrium, prostate, these are hormone driven. So physical activity is uh, clearly related to decreased risk, okay? So again, this doesn't mean, you know, doing excessive, you know, go, you don't have to go to the gym. What is considered is like brisk walking, you know, 30 minutes a day is, a, is considered appropriate, you know. So you don't need to do anything complicated. You don't need to start, you know, bungee jumping and do excessive stuff, you know, just brisk walking 30 minutes a day. Now, this is something that is getting more and more uh, and more and more important. And I know a lot of you probably are working in the computer industry. Sitting is becoming the new smoking. And this is very important. You know, the amount of time you sit is 
they related to obesity, type 2 diabetes, heart disease, and cancer. So this is a risk that is clearly underappreciated. The more time you sit, the higher your risk. So, you know, try to, you know, even um, in our practice, what we have done is we have this special, uh, uh, where the computers are set, set up at a higher level. So people are, um, you know, have an option to uh, stand and work. So, you know, there are things you can do that yourself. You know, you can have uh, one of those elevator tables uh, or even if you're sitting, you need to get up and move around a little bit. Stationary bikes. Uh, if you're watching TV, you know, do some treadmill, you know. So those things, you know, the more time you sit, you know, the, back, the worse it is for you. So, and some of this time you sit, uh, spend sitting, the adverse effect cannot be negated by main, making up by exercise. So, you know, so that's very important. So you can't just sit the whole Monday through Friday and then do a lot of exercise on weekends. It doesn't work that way. And one thing I didn't mention, another S that is important is sleeping. You know, so it's very important to have adequate sleep. I don't have that on the slide, but you know, remember sitting, sleeping, sugar, you know, these are some of the new things that are important in cancer. You know, avoid sugar, avoid too much sitting, and you know, have adequate sleep. And and one another S that we are learning to behave, learning to understand is stress. You know, stress appears to decrease your immune surveillance, and that's a, a fourth S you can add to that. Uh, so excessive sunlight, you know, this is more important if you have fair skin, but all of us can uh, develop skin cancers. Um, so that's you know less of an issue issue in, in for us uh, who are dark skin, but uh, it's appropriate to put sunscreen. Okay, this is uh, this is considered adequate, I mean, appropriate protection, uh, especially if you are uh, going out in the sun. Viruses are a, a very, uh, you know, targeted way you can prevent cancers. So, for example, uh, HPV infection is associated with breast, uh, sorry, cervical cancer as well as head and neck cancers. So these two cancers, head and neck cancers and cervical cancers can be prevented by taking HPV vaccine. And it was an unfortunate certain religious groups in Texas and all, which is, you know, they, 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 I mean, that's the height of, I would say, idiocy. They were against the HPV vaccine. But anyway, HPV is a vaccine that is available that should be given to uh, uh, both boys and girls. And the age cutoff for HPV vaccine now is all the way up to 45. So if you have not had it, you can actually have the vaccine even now. So HPV vaccine is uh, helpful to prevent cervical cancer and, um, and, and also uh, head and neck cancer. Uh, there is also vaccines against hepatitis B. You know, hepatitis B vaccine can prevent uh, for hepatitis B. So, you know, so there are several vaccines that are easy to get and that can prevent um, uh, virus-induced cancers. <clears throat> Carcinogens at work. I don't know any of you here who are working this these fields, but if there are many carcinogens that you get exposed to at certain works, you know, if you are mining, so, you know, as arsenic, construction, you know, asbestos, benzene, you know, people who are in the petroleum industry, uh, metal workers, you know, exposed to chromium and a major risk factor for lung cancer, um, leather uh, manufacturing, you know, the leather dust is associated with nasal bladder cancers. So there's a uh, radon. Radon is actually associated with not only mining, certain homes, uh, at least in the US, have a high amount of radon. So there is a way you can actually test for radon. I have personally had seen patients, uh, both husband and wife, developing cancers around the same time. And uh, you know when they detected their radon level in their basement was significantly high. Uh, so you know radon is something, uh, vinyl chloride in the rubber industry, wood dust, so there are certain carcinogens at workplace. So if you are certain, if you are in this particular uh, jobs, it's very important to use adequate protection, including um, the mask and adequate, uh, you know, things to prevent uh, uh, cancer agents getting into your body. Now we will talk uh, like the second half. We will talk about certain uh, treatments. Basically, a kind of a brief overview of various treatments and. Uh, this is uh, Dr. Hunter who lived in the 18th century. 
So, in terms of cancer treatment, you know, cancer has been described by you know all times, you know, Hippocrates and Galen. They all described cancer, but in terms of treatment, uh, there was really nothing that was done. Uh, Hunter actually lived in the 18th century. He was actually uh, the teacher of Jenner, you know, the one who invented the vaccine. So he was a amazingly uh, good surgeon, and this was before anesthesia. So he was a Scottish surgeon who is considered one of the early pioneers of cancer surgery. So if a cancer is limited to an organ, you can remove it. And you know, that's one of the curative way you can treat cancer. Now this kind of scary diagram, this is so-called radical mastectomy. This was basically how breast cancer was treated. And the surgeon who promoted this was a surgeon from um, uh, Hopkins uh, whose name was uh, Halstead. Uh, and this procedure, so-called Halstead procedure, this remained the standard of care for breast cancer for decades. Uh, he was in the late 19th century. Halstead and his students throughout the world performed this radical mastectomy uh, as the primary treatment for breast cancer. Sorry about that, that is my cuckoo clock. Anyway, so Halstead idea of cancer was cancer is a localized disease that spread by local extension. And for almost 70 to 80 years, this was considered, yeah, I mean, that is what it is. No one really questioned it. So the idea was to remove as much cancer as possible, remove the, the, the muscles, the, remove the clavicle. I mean, this red, the, the, the woman who underwent radical mastectomy, they were almost crippled. It was a very, very traumatic, disfiguring surgery. And what happened was some of those patients still died from breast cancer. So it took almost 80, 80 years in multiple studies that showed Cancer is really not a local disease. So early, even early stage cancer, you can have systemic disease. So the focus on local treatment is probably misguided. And a surgeon at Fox Chase called Bernard Fisher, he is the one who actually considered this idea of multi-modality approach to cancer. Cancer needed, it's a local, it needs a local treatment. You need to remove as much as you can. You also combine that with, say, radiation or chemotherapy. So nowadays, breast cancer surgery is done by, um, if it is early stage, which most of the breast cancers are early stage, is removed through something called lumpectomy, where you just remove the lump. You remind the remaining breast is left intact. Most of the surgeons nowadays, after you do the lumpectomy, you can't even see the patient had breast cancer surgery. It has gotten that good. But you combine this with radiation and chemo to prevent the cancer from spreading to other places. So surgery has evolved from what used to be a very uh, traumatic and uh, uh, disfiguring procedure to something that is you know, much simpler these days. Now, other modality we use is radiation. We all know what radiation um, uh, is a very uh, effective therapy. There are various ways you can do radiation. One is called external beam radiation. That is your radiation is given where the machine is outside the body. Okay, And that is the commonest way you give radiation. You can also give internal radiation. That is, for example, say for, for prostate cancer, you can place radioactive seeds within the prostate. And the seed actually give the radiation with, to the just the prostate. Now the advantage of this is, you know, this is given to just the a organ in question without radiating uh, other organs. You know, the downside is, of course, the CD is going to stay in there, even though it is, it won't be radioactive because after you know a few weeks, the half life will be gone, but the seed will be still there, and it's a, it requires a surgical procedure. Systemic radiation is when you give the radiation through the vein. Now, for example, you can give a radioactive um, a compound that uh, say hone into the bones. So you give it through the vein and it goes to the bone and it can you know treat bone cancer. You can give radioactive iodine which actually goes and kill 
thyroid cancer. So that is given internally. So there are various ways you can give radiation. So radiation kills cancer by direct action, causing DNA damage, also by indirect action, by free radicals and DNA damage and cell death. So radiation works both ways. Now, radiation also has evolved significantly over the past several decades. And what has made radiation much more um, targeted is advances in computing and robotics. And this actually is a, a diagram of what is called a cyber knife. The term knife kind of confuses people. There is no knife involved. The knife is a term to use. This is almost like putting a knife, you know, with radiation being so targeted so that it can be like a knife. You can almost think of a surgery, even though there is no surgery involved. So what it involves is you have the radiation uh, machine, you have the X-ray source, and you have a synchronized camera, and there is a robot that in real time calculate the position of the tumor. So what you do is, say for example, if you have a lung cancer, you put in a metallic fiducia. You know, it's a called fiducial, that's a metal within the tumor. A radio, radiologist put in the, the fiducial, and then you take the x-ray while the patient is getting radiated. And what happens is the, the robot will, in real time, will target based on the patient's breathing movements. So it's very interesting, you know, it's very, in, you know, very involved uh, mathematics and calculations, but thanks to computers, it is possible. So the, the, the patient will be breathing, so the fiducial will be moving, uh, but the, 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 the arrow of the radiation will be moving simultaneously. So it's very interesting and very targeted way you can give treatment. This is actually our cyber knife machine in our hospital. And uh, this is a patient uh, case. You can see you know, that bright spot is cancer. This one in the, I, can't, I don't know whether you guys can see my arrow, but that is within the heart. That is normal heart. Now, heart has a bright spot. The, what is mentioned, what is, you know, uh, arrow with the cancer, that's where you have the bright spot and that's where you have high intake of uh, the fluorodeoxy glucose. This is after treatment. What you see is you only have the clip remaining. And this clip is the, the fiducial. Okay, this fiducial is used to target the radiation. Now, this is very effective for cancer that is limited to a, just a one organ where it has not spread. Suppose this, this particular patient is not a treatment, not a patient for surgical removal. Cyber knife is, like you can see, that cyber knife can use almost like a, a removal of the tumor. So after two months, you don't see the cancer anymore. Because this is a way to give very high dose radiation without affecting normal lung outside because of the precise targeting. Now, chemotherapy, again, you know, this is, uh, you know, we don't have time to go through, but in briefly, when you say chemotherapy, it can be various, what, it depends on what is your goal. Sometimes you give chemotherapy just so that you can make the patient symptoms get better and make them live longer. Your attempt is not cure. And that is called palliative chemotherapy. And this is what we do when you have a very advanced cancer. You can't cure it, but you can make them live longer. In certain cancers, like say myeloma, much longer, you know, almost like five, 10 years. And some cancers like pancreas, maybe not that well, you know, we can only make them live maybe another six months to a year. So that is called palliative chemotherapy. Primary chemotherapy is when the chemotherapy is the only treatment. And this is where certain leukemias and lymphomas, chemotherapy is the only treatment. And this is curative even in patients who have so-called stage four disease. So lymphoma, for example, you can have a stage four lymphoma, you can still potentially cure it with chemotherapy. Now, induction neoadjuvant, these are terms we use for patients, say for example, have a cancer, but it is say too big to remove by surgery, but you can try to give some chemo, shrink the tumor, so the surgeons can remove it. And this is called neoadjuvant chemo. And the adjuvant chemo, that term is used for, say, a breast cancer patient who had the breast cancer removed, but we know that those patients still have certain circulating tumor cells. Our 
ക്യാൻസർ വരാണ്ടിരിക്കാനുള്ള കീമോന് അഡ്ജുവൻ കീമോ എന്ന് പറയുന്നത് കൺകമറ്റൻ കീമോ ഇസ് ബേസിക്കലി സം ടൈം റേഡിയേഷൻ വർക്ക്സ് ബെറ്റർ വെൻ യു കമ്പൈൻ ഇറ്റ് വിത്ത് കീമോ തെറാപ്പി അതിനാണ് റേഡിയേഷൻ കീമോ ഒന്നിച്ചു കൊടുക്കുന്നതിനാണ് കൺകമറ്റൻ കീമോ തെറാപ്പി എന്ന് പറയുന്നത് കീമോ പ്രിവെൻഷൻ എന്ന് പറയുന്നത് സെർട്ടൻ ഹോർമോണൽ ഡ്രഗ്സ് ദാറ്റ് യു ക്യാൻ ഗിവ് ടു പേഷ്യൻസ് ഹു ആർ ഹൈ റിസ്ക് ഫോർ ബ്രസ്റ്റ് ക്യാൻസർ യൂഷ്വലി യൂസ് ഇൻ ബ്രസ്റ്റ് ക്യാൻസർ സോ ബ്രസ്റ്റ് ക്യാൻസർ ഓർ ഹു ഹാവ് നോട്ട് ബ്രസ്റ്റ് ക്യാൻസർ ബട്ട് high grade dysplasia or ductal carcinoma who do not have invasive cancer you can give hormonal drugs for them from developing full blown cancer now again this is this requires another talk all by itself of course we are not going to do it but chemotherapy is one thing where it is very specific how we target it. you know radiation is radiation you know it is basically the all the advances is how precisely you give it but uh, with chemotherapy what is becoming more refined is what kind of cancer what is the targets and how you do it so this is kind of like you know a brief outline of way, you know some of the drugs we use this is again like a very small percentage of uh, techniques and drugs we use in treatment so drugs that can directly affect the dna of course dna is what makes up cells divide apa anti metabolites and the drugs are. these are some of the older drugs uh, dna intercalators like doxorubicin alkylators you know cisplatin uh, these are some of the older drugs stop by some rise some of the newer drugs are dna stabilizers and they are called parp inhibitors this is very effective in patients who have so called brca mutation now on the cell surface you have certain targets you can attack for example vascular endothelial growth factor you know this is the target that makes the cells make blood vessels grow into the tumor that can be targeted that can be blocked her2 is a target that is present in several cancers including breast her stands for human epidermal receptor growth factor there are many her her2 her1 her3 so these again can be blocked these are growth factors signals growth signals that can be blocked uh in immuno- uh, insulin like growth factor that's again that can be blocked uh hormones of course uh, estrogen that can be blocked within the tumor you know there are several other mo- you know so this targets actually before it makes the cells grow it goes through various things so you can block them intracellularly this is a pathway called mtor which is called mammalian target of rapamycin it's also important aging actually you block the mtor so the downstream uh, pathway can be blocked cdk or cyclin d kinase that's another thing that can be blocked you know these are all drugs that we have approved drugs all these things are different pathways and different drugs we have the cell division is mediated through something called the microtubules the tubules can be blocked and they are very effective against you know chemo drugs so this is kind of like a a small uh, uh, kind of a snapshot of various drugs and mechanisms that we have to prevent cancers then we we have a bunch of drugs what we call as targeted therapy basically the the poster boy of targeted therapy is a drug called glivec this was approved about in 2000 for a disease called chronic myeloid leukemia cml is a very simple disease in that it doesn't have lot of mutations unlike other cancers so adile there is one enzyme ana adinte prashnam our enzyme is a kinase a kinase uh, basically works by binding to atp so the glivec is kind of bind to the uh, same place where the atp binds it's almost like a lock and key so glivec replaces the kinase so atp cannot bind to the enzyme so there is no more gas so this kinase it's almost like a motor the motor doesn't work so think of like a uh, you know you are you have a car and you are you know making the you know the gas you can't put fill in gas anymore so this is how glivec works and uh, there are many drugs like that these are so called kinase inhibitors they are very targeted they works in that specific group of patients who have that particular mutation now we all know about, about evolution cancer is interesting in that it actually evolves uh because what happens in the beginning is not what happens towards the end of the cancer so you know cancer cells are very smart 
So when you, uh, when you subject them to a certain therapy, some of the cells become resistant and they, then that resistant cell is the one that will grow next time. So it keeps on evolving and evolving. So that's why when cancer come back, you know, the first time it come back, it is a little bit more hard to treat than the second, first time. And when so it comes second time, it is even more hard because the cancers that are surviving each round of treatment is going to be more advanced. However, oncology is also evolving. Now what we can see is that as cancer evolves, you can also simultaneously look what are the clones that are evolving so we can try to target those cells. This is a patient of mine. You can see over a period, this is this different colors are different cell lines in the peripheral blood that are evolving as the patient is going through various treatments. This is a timeline of a lung cancer patient over a period of two years. So you can see various uh, clones are you know, some goes down, some goes up. And what you can do is you can try to target the highest clone. And this is in peripheral blood. This is called liquid biopsy, which means there is no biopsy. This is looking at this kind of tumor cells within the blood, which is so, you know, amazing in that you don't have to do another biopsy. You know, biopsy has its own side of, you know, it's a surgical procedure. So this is just a blood test. And you can do this at varying points in treatment to see what is evolving and try to target the that particular target. Immunotherapy is like the, the newest and the most exciting field in all of immuno, all of oncology. Basically, immune surveillance is what we lose when you have early cancer. So microevolution at a very early stage select for immune uh, resistance because the if you have multiple cells, the cells that survive are the cells that can prevent being eaten up by our immune cells. Immune cells are really very powerful cells, though they can actually kill cancer cells. But early cancer cells, a lot of patients, a lot of normal people are developing cancer cells in our body all the time. But our immune cells can kill and attack them. But sometimes they mutate and become resistant. So immune escape is an important pathway in a lot of cancers. Say so targeted treatment is only for very small group, you know, so for example, CML has a target, it works in that cancer, whereas immune mediated treatment works for a lot of cancers because it's this immune escape, with regard to cancers are important. This appears com complicated, you know, but it is not. Basically what happens is, this is our immune cells, T cells and dendritic cells, dendritic cells. this is what, uh, you know, mediate our cell mediated immunity. So the, pathway that is widely used called PDL1 and PDL2, these are ligands on the tumor, they act, think of it as a blanket, an invisibility blanket. And this is how I explain to patients. So you have your T cells and if they see the tumor cells, the T cells will attack the tumor cells. But tumors are smart. They develop the so-called invisibility blankets these PDL1, PDL2, these are called checkpoints. So they check the immune cells from acting upon the tumor. But what we have done now is we have developed checkpoint inhibitors. So that means inhibitors that can remove the inhibitors. You know, it's double negative. Think of it as medicines that can remove the invisibility blanket. So once the invisibility blanket is removed, the T cells can see the tumor cells and can kill the tumor cells. And this is kind of dramatic. Sometimes you see this is a patient who had single agent immunotherapy. This is a patient who had widespread lung cancer. You see those red area on the right side. And this is after immunotherapy. You can see it is completely gone. This patient did not have any chemotherapy. So this is uh, the effect of immunotherapy. It's pretty impressive. Um, other immunotherapy you know, techniques are you can take the patient's cells. Say for example, here dendritic cells can be taken from a prostate cancer patient and can be trained, you know, the dendritic cells can be trained to attack prostate cancer, so, and put it back into the patient. So this is really fascinating. You take the patient's dendritic cells, you prepare it in such a way that it can be uh, extremely efficient and looking at prostate cancer. So you put this same patient's on dendritic cells back into the patient, it'll go and kill the patient's tumor cells. 
This is another uh, immunotherapy technique also called CAR T cells. This is again, you take the patient's T cells outside the body and you manipulate the T cells so that you add, this is called chimeric antigen receptor. So these are T cells that are primed to attack the patient's tumor. So if the patients say, have leukemia, these T cells are primed. This is patient's own cells. You put it back and these T cells are, these are actually live medicines because this is living cells. So you inject into the blood of the patient so it will continue to expand in the patient's body and it continues to be uh, checked on the patient's cells. Now, I added this slide actually, you know, just two days ago because I mean, you know, I was thinking of this, but then I forgot, but then I saw this article so one thing that a lot of people do is, you know, this kind of intermediate approach, you know, those a lot of people will say, okay, you know, I'm going to have, you know, chemotherapy and radiation and whatever is appropriate, what is modern medicine, but why, why should, should I will also take some supplements? And this is extremely common, even among educators. So, you know, so there is, in terms of cancer therapy, you know, there is one group who don't even do anything modern medicine. And then there are people who will do modern medicine. And then there is a large group of patients who do modern medicine, but also do all this kind of antioxidants and all these things. But this is the important thing to remember. What is good for your normal cell is twice or thrice as good for the cancer cells. So say for example, you take antioxidants while you are taking radiation, for example, it will protect your cancer cells more than it will protect your normal cells. So what appears to what may be good for you, when you have cancer, doesn't mean it is good for you anymore. So this is an exceedingly common practice. A lot of patients take supposedly good things like antioxidants. And again, you know, the role of antioxidants is controversial to begin with. But when you have cancer, you should not take things like that. I'm going to end by, you know, there are so many new things in cancer outside of what we discussed. This is one fascinating thing that is now approved for um, cancer treatment. This is called tumor treating field. This is actually electricity. You had to wear this uh, um, on your skull. This is a battery pack. This is, of course, not a patient. You know, he looks so happy to be a patient or she. This is approved for um, glioblastoma, which is one of the hardest, you know, difficult to treat brain tumor. So what you do is if patient wear this mask, all the time, about 18 hours a day, which is kind of cumbersome, but it actually more than doubles the five-year survival. So patients who had been on this had a five-year survival of about 20%. Again, that is not very high, but a brain tumor, that is pretty high because the five-year survival without this was about five to seven percent. So this, what it, what, it, what it does is, it's actually sent tumor treating electric fields. So, you know, we mentioned about spindles, Spindles are important in cell division. So the electric fields actually disrupt the, the spindle cells, which is kind of fascinating. So this is not chemo, not radiation, and not, of course, not surgery, but this is a brand new way you can treat, uh, you know, certain cancer, especially glioblastoma, which is a brain tumor. It's approved in that indication. Uh, so again, uh, you know, that's actually my last slide. Just again, want to show uh, we are making progress and you know, cancer is something where we, science has progressed significantly and um, you know, but it's also an area where there's a lot of voodoo that is still going on, unfortunately. That's my last slide and I'll stop there. Thank you, Dr. Ashraf. Yeah, it's already something we use already clinically. And only using those, so, you know, blood test for cancer is so-called, you know, liquid biopsy is already there. I'm like, so I told you, I showed that slide. Uh, so, so this is not new. I'm sorry, let me see where that. So we have test to see circulating tumor cells. It's already approved. We, we have been using it for the past two, three years. All the tests that all this, Test, you know, all this, uh, what has been done so far is in patients who have documented cancer. That is already there. We, we are like, we have, we use that in clinical practice. Pakshe, blood tests to look for cancer in a patient who do not have a diagnosis of cancer, 
that is still not fully validated you know we still don't have a blood test that will find early stage cancer which there are certain trials that is looking at it but there is no test like that that is approved as of now of course you know things may change in the next two to five years there's a lot of interest in that field but as of now screening in a vehicle but now we have cancer in the blood till it it is not complicated we have that already we use that i mean i have been using it for the past two three years cancer cells in a patient who already have cancer but what would be helpful will be a normal person who don't have cancer do a blood test instead of say colonoscopy and say okay you may have colon cancer our test is fully validated okay um cancer cells are in the cells and in the cells are in the cells and then the response is to mimic the treatment. Do you have any treatment? Every cancer treatment is developed by trying it on other animals. You know, that is the tissue that is in the tissue culture. nude uh, mouse or nude mice and the models learn and all the cancer treatment every cancer treatment medicine is first tried in animals ipo nammal ubayikuna almost every cancer treatment aadyam thana humans la aarum test illa cancer medicine so almost every cancer drug is tried in mouse models the problem is exaggerated reporting ipo nammal or mouse model la or cancer arengalum cure eedu nu parnale that is not a news for most of us mouse in the cancer cure in the is routine and that doesn't always translate it to humans karena one and the sali mouse models are not even real na- healthy mouse most of the mouse models of cancer are called nude mouse nude mice nude in varana the nude in the not in the sense they are not wearing clothes nude in the sense they don't have an immune system these are the mice models that are easy to try cancer pashe are the mice le work idu nanjittu that doesn't really mean it may not it may work in in humans then one part whatsapp message gana you know cancer cured in that and cancer cured in this so of course cancer is we we can cure cancer pashe mouse models exaggerated exaggerated i'll the reporting is very common pashe every drug is always tried in mouse models uh, before we try it in humans and mouse model uh, response is always exciting but that doesn't necessarily mean anything until we try it in human cancers and then real human patients we can't say okay this is going to work you know if something works in mouse does mean that okay it works in mouse that's all it means it may work in humans it may not if every drug that works in mouse worked in humans we would have completely cured cancer already you know uh, but only some of the drugs that works in mouse work in humans can i speak നന്നായിരുന്നു നല്ല ഒരു പ്രസന്റേഷൻ ആയിരുന്നു കഴിഞ്ഞ തവണത്തെ കാട്ടിലും കുറച്ചുകൂടി കാര്യങ്ങൾ മനസ്സിലാക്കാനും സാധിച്ചു നല്ല നന്നായിരുന്നു എനിക്കൊരു ഒരു ക്വസ്റ്റ്യൻ ഉണ്ട് ചില ക്യാൻസറിന് വാക്സിനേഷൻ അവൈലബിൾ ആണെന്നൊരു ന്യൂസ് അതിനെ കുറിച്ച് ഒന്ന് പറയാം malignant melanoma so immunotherapy in one another can be through vaccination can be through so called checkpoint inhibitor modified t cells or so called car t cells modified dendritic cells so vaccination is one of the way you could potentially treat a cancer there has been so many trials in melanoma but because by the time you know the cancer is already evolved and the vaccination takes an adequate immune system vaccination per se for somebody who has advanced cancer has not become that viable even though that is still an option in a patient say for example uh, cml a chronic myeloid leukemia patient and cancer nammal full aid to control it kind a final last phase le vaccine kodutte maatan okay there are trials and but existing cancer in vaccine kond matram it is still you know in in research however where vaccine is important is vaccine to prevent viruses that causes cancer hepatitis b 
എച്ച് പി വി ഇങ്ങനത്തെ വാക്സിൻ ഇങ്ങനത്തെ വൈറസിനൊക്കെ വാക്സിൻ കൊടുത്താല് സോ ദാറ്റ് വാക്സിൻ ഇൻഡ്യൂസ് ക്യാൻസർ വോൺക്ക ബട്ട് ഓൾറെഡി ക്യാൻസർ ഉള്ള ആൾക്കാർക്ക് വാക്സിൻ തെറാപ്പി അലോൺ ഇസ് ബീ ഇൻവെസ്റ്റിഗേറ്റഡ് ബട്ട് ഇറ്റ്സ് നോട്ട് ലൈക്ക് യുവർ സ്റ്റാൻഡേർഡ് ഓഫ് കെയർ ഓക്കെ താങ്ക് യു ഹായ് ഡോക്ടർ ഇറ്റ് വാസ് വെരി നൈസ് നല്ല ഒരു ഇൻഫർമേഷൻ കിട്ടി കേൾക്കാവോ യെസ് യെസ് ഐ കാൻ ഹിയർ യെസ് ഞാനിപ്പോ ക്യാൻസറിലേക്ക് ഉള്ള സബ്ജക്റ്റിലേക്ക് കിടക്കുന്നില്ല അത്രയ്ക്കുള്ള നോളജ് ഇല്ല എനിക്ക് അതിനെ പറ്റി കൂടുതൽ ചോദിക്കാനായിട്ട് ഞാൻ ഇതിൻ്റെ അകത്ത് കേട്ട കൂട്ടത്തിൽ ഈ സപ്ലിമെന്റിന്റെ കാര്യം പറഞ്ഞു സപ്ലിമെന്റ് അതൊരു സഫിഷ്യന്റ് അല്ലെന്നോ അല്ലേ അഡ്വൈസബിൾ അല്ലെന്നോ മറ്റോ അല്ലേ ആക്ച്വലി ആഴ്ചയിൽ ഒന്ന് രണ്ട് ദിവസം ഇതെടുക്കാറുണ്ട് ഇതൊരു ട്വൽവ് ഗ്രാം പ്രോട്ടീൻ ആണ് അതിനകത്തുള്ളത് ഔട്ട് ഓഫ് ടു തേർട്ടി ഫൈവ് എം എൽ അതുകൂടാതെ ഒരു ട്വന്റി സിക്സ് വിറ്റാമിൻസ് ആൻഡ് മിനറൽസ് ഉണ്ടെന്നാണ് കേട്ടോ അപ്പൊ ഞാൻ ചോദിക്കാൻ വന്നത് ഞാൻ എന്റെ ഡോക്ടറോട് ചോദിച്ചു എടുക്കുന്നത് ഞാൻ സെവന്റി വൺ ഇയർ ഓൾഡ് ബാക്ക് ഏക്ക് ഷോൾഡർ പെയിൻ ഇങ്ങനെയുള്ള കാര്യങ്ങളൊക്കെ ഉണ്ടായിരുന്നു അപ്പൊ അതിനൊക്കെ ഈ ടൈൽനോൾ ഒന്നും എടുക്കുന്നതിന് പോരായിട്ട് ഇതുകൊണ്ട് പ്രയോജനം ഉണ്ടാവുന്ന ഡോക്ടർ തന്നെ പറഞ്ഞത് കൊണ്ട് ആഴ്ച ഒരിക്കലോ പ്രാവശ്യം ഒക്കെ ഞാൻ ഇതൊരു വീക്ക്നെസ് തോന്നുന്നുണ്ട് അതിൽ നിന്ന് എനിക്ക് അഡ്വാൻറ്റേജ് ഫീൽ ചെയ്തിട്ടുണ്ട് എന്റെ ബാക്ക് പെയിൻ ഒക്കെ വളരെ റിലീഫ് തോന്നുന്നുണ്ട് അല്ലാതെ ഞാൻ മസിൽസ് ഒന്നും ഉണ്ടാക്കാൻ വേണ്ടി കഴിക്കുന്നുണ്ട് അപ്പൊ അത് എന്തെങ്കിലും ഡിസഡ്വാൻറ്റേജ് ഉള്ളതായിട്ട് തോന്നുന്നുണ്ടോ അത് എനിക്ക് തുടരാവും ഡിസഡ്വാൻറ്റേജ് ഒന്നുമില്ല ആകെ എന്താ വെച്ചാല് സപ്ലിമെന്റ്സ് യുനോ ഹാസ് നമുക്ക് ഫുഡ് കൂടെ കിട്ടുകയാണെങ്കിൽ യു കാൺ ദാറ്റ് ഈസ് ബെറ്റർ അപ്പൊ പക്ഷെ നിങ്ങൾ ബിസി ആണ് ഫുഡ് ഉണ്ടാക്കാൻ സമയമില്ല ഒക്കെ ആണെങ്കിൽ ഫൈൻ പക്ഷെ നമ്മൾ ഫുഡിൽ ഒരു നല്ല കോമ്പണൻറ് കണ്ടിട്ട് ദാറ്റ്സ് എ വെരി ടിപ്പിക്കൽ അമേരിക്കൻ വേ ഓഫ് ഡൂയിങ് തിങ്സ് യു നോ യു ഫൈൻഡ് എ ഗുഡ് കോമ്പണൻ ഫ്രം എ ഫുഡ് ആൻഡ് യു നോ ടേൺ ദാറ്റ് ഇൻഡ് എ ടാബ്ലറ്റ് അപ്പൊ അത് ദാറ്റ് മേ നോട്ട് ബി ഇക്വൽ പക്ഷെ ഐ മീൻ ഇറ്റ്സ് ഓക്കെ ഐ മീൻ ഐ എം നോട്ട് അഗെയിൻസ്റ്റ് പക്ഷെ നെവർ അത് ഇഫ് യു ആർ ഹെൽത്തി ദാറ്റ് ഫൈൻ പക്ഷെ ക്യാൻസർ ഉള്ള ഒരാൾക്ക് ഈ സപ്ലിമെന്റ്സ് ക്യാൻ ബി യു നോ ക്യാൻ ഓഫ് ഡേഞ്ചർ സോ If somebody has cancer, they should talk to their doctor before they take any supplement. Similarly, alcohol intake in the area, there are two drinks, men and one drink for women. Again, it depends on the age. If you have a lot of men and women, you have a lot of health. So that is the upper limit. I would, I would rather stay in, away from drink altogether. I am saying that is the upper limit. That doesn't, that's, not a, uh, that's not a recommendation. <laughs> <laughs> it's not a recommendation it is still like the upper limit you you should yeah well amle allergy ga illa cancer varanulla chance illa wood ile nasal cancer undu kanichu ee nammada naatlulla ee carpenters okke wood il work cheyunnaru avaru nammada naatlu angane oru nasal care evadeyilum cancer ulla ayittu uh well you know these are uh, you know suppose suppose i mean again like i said you know nasal cancer is a rare cancer pashe if you are you know so if you if you see like a 10 nasal cancer patients you know at least three or four of them are people who worked in the wood industry wood industry right? yeah so if, since it is rare cancer you won't see that many cancers even if it is high, but nammada keralathilulla carpenters onnu nerthi onnum mask onnum dharichittu work cheyanaayittu kandittilla right right you can go under even all our life mulke nammala rendu moonu generation e kandittundu right car ku ingane oru asuvam vannaayittu nammal kelichittundu all these are based on you know large number of trials nammale individual experience and observation allalla nammal medicine upayogikkunnathu correct correct okay and yeah it was very nice thank you hello you are so good oh hi vijay oh uh, hi vijay uh, wonderful presentation so i have a question um, i don't know if you have talked about this in the talk so there are cases that have come across where people did their treatment in india for cancer and at a, like at some stage or stage 4 they were recommended for like medic clinical trials in the us i'm not sure if i'm using the right word yeah that's right yeah so what what is the process that goes into this thing and like what do they try in that uh, and what like what is new in in the the treatment versus the clinical trials that they try just curious about what sure doing. sure so uh, yeah that's a good question so namlu uh, uh, cancer uh, all this progress is made thanks to cancer patients you know idilippa namlu ipum every treatment 
the one people one group of people we have to say the most thanks are actual cancer patients so namli parna mari cancer you know the only rubber you know oru ivide oru term and the rub when the rubber hit the when the rubber hit the road right so that is you can have all this preclinical data you can have all this wonderful science but unless you really try it on real people you don't know if it is going to be really going to work or not appo cancer uh, is one where we have lots of clinical trials you know so when you have a patient who have cancer if you have a approved standard of care most of the time you may do that as the first line treatment but beyond first line for a clinical trial undengil you can use that basically what is clinical trial is they suppose you have a new drug say uh, you know pertuzumab this is not a new drug by the way this is an old drug uh, can you all see my slide yes okay yes. so pertuzumab is a drug that bro- block the her2 pathway so namlu ipam pandu her2 ulla breast cancer patients nu we only gave them herceptin but then this drug was noted to block not only her2 but also her3 the so called dimerization so clinically and preclinically it made sense you know mouse models it appeared pertuzumab kodthapo breast cancer shrank even better than just herceptin or trastuzumab so to see in real life if it is going to work what you do is you take patients who have breast cancer who are her2 positive give one group only trastuzumab another group you give them trastuzumab and pertuzumab and what you find is that patients who got both the drug had a much better survival much better response then you know this is a real drug and it get approved so that is the process of clinical trials now pertuzumab is now approved so it doesn't need to be in a clinical trial to get it but sometime you may have a drugs you know that is not yet approved say for example this insulin like growth factor this is not an approved drug so <laughs> if you want to get this drug you you need to be in a clinical trial to get it because clinical trials are looking at drugs that are not fda approved before fda approved you know it has to go through various clinical trials to get it approved so unfortunately india lipper oru vaadu clinical trials illa appo avade oru cancer patients nu oru vaadu you know if they have the money and everything to uh, afford sometimes they can come to us and may get enrolled in a clinical trial when they run out of other options okay thank you very much sir